Today is the third Sunday of Lent. Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation, and house upon house shall fall. Words, my friends in Christ, taken from today's gospel. And how can Christ agree with anyone who does not agree with the body of the church itself and with the universal brotherhood? Words of St. Cyprian, Doctor of the Church, on today's Gospel as a warning against heresy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Suppose I had an evil twin. Now, there are a lot of traditionalist clergy who would say that this would be unnecessary since the original is bad enough. But let's suppose that for the sake of argument. So, my evil twin stands up here in the pulpit today and says to you, there is nothing to prevent ordaining a woman a priest. Or forget about the pro-life movement. You people can't say abortion is a sin. Or mortal sin, you don't have to believe in that. Stealing, don't worry, it's not a sin. Artificial contraception, not a sin either. Fires of hell, purgatory, don't really exist. Or even that your soul is immortal. You don't have to believe that. So one of you, I hope, would stand up and say, well, uh, you're a heretic. A Catholic has to believe in those things. And my twin says, well, why? And you respond, well, it's church teaching. It's infallible. So the twin comes back and says, well, who says so? And you say, well, the Pope says so. The Pope is infallible in faith and morals when he teaches uh, ex cathedra. That's what Vatican I says. Popes have made ex cathedra pronouncements about all these things, so of the church council, so we have to believe them. You're a heretic if you deny them. So then the imposter holds up this book. And he says, this is a translation of the Enchiridion Symbolorum, which is the sources of Catholic dogma. It's a chronological digest of the uh, teachings of the church. And he says here, he gives you the book, show me. Show me where a pope has defined these things ex cathedra. Take your time. So you fumble through the index point by point in the book. Women, priests, abortion, artificial contraception, mortal sin, stealing, the fires of hell, purgatory, immortality of the soul. Well, certain pronouncements talk about these teachings. And as you bring each one up, the evil twin says to you, Aha, nice try. But it doesn't meet all the rules that Vatican I laid down for a solemn and fallible teaching a solemn and fallible pronouncement from a pope or a general council. And at the end he says, so, the prohibitions against women, priests, abortion, they're not as infallible as you thought, are they? They can change. You don't have to take them all that seriously, do you? What would your answer be to that statement? As traditional Catholics, we have been confronted since the 60s with the problems of the errors of Vatican II. How do we explain it? One of the things that we come across at the beginning is the Pope problem. The great school catechism says this, that the Pope is infallible in faith and morals when he teaches ex cathedra. Now, that is something that's very rare. So the tendency was to say this, well, aha, none of uh, the Paul VI and Vatican II changes are really solemn ex cathedra pronouncements, so we don't have to accept them. Ex cathedra teachings are the only times when the church is, is truly exercising her infallible magisterium. And the rest, we think, we can leave aside. But this, alas, is completely wrong. If it, the principle were true, 
my evil twin would be right about women priests and abortion and so on. There are no solemn ex cathedra pronouncements about these things from either popes or from councils. And in fact, very few, there are very few of the solemn pronouncements, uh, of these solemn pronouncements in the Enchiridion Symbolorum at all. Very few of them. But we know that we are obliged to believe that it is impossible to have women priests, that abortion is a sin, that the soul is immortal, and so on. How do we know that? We know that from what is called the Church's Universal Ordinary Magisterium. Universal Ordinary Magisterium. Even devout and conscientious traditional Catholics who are otherwise very well versed in the faith are often unfamiliar with this notion and how it relates to what we believe. We know and remember about solemn ex cathedra statements, but universal ordinary magisterium, we really don't know too much about that. So I'm going to tell you about that a little bit today. First of all, what is magisterium? Well, this is the 25 cent word in Latin for the act of teaching. The act of teaching. It can also refer to what is taught, what is proposed for belief. Now there are two types of magisterium teaching. There is the solemn or the extraordinary magisterium. This is the teaching on faith or morals that is done with great solemnity by a pope or a council in union with the pope. And this is the popular idea of ex cathedra or infallible teaching, which you remember from your catechism. And this exercise of teaching authorities actually is relatively rare. Relatively rare. So that is the solemn extraordinary magisterium. Now, the universal ordinary magisterium, what does that mean? That is the teaching of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, that is to say the Pope and, and bishops together, whether in council or whether dispersed throughout the world concerning faith and morals. Hierarchy of the Catholic Church, Pope and bishops together, whether in council or dispersed throughout the world concerning faith and morals. Now this teaching too is infallible. This teaching too is free from error. Uh, the universal ordinary magisterium is acting when the church uh, preaches a revealed doctrine to the faithful. When that doctrine is taught in schools, when the bishops publish the doctrine, when the fathers of the church, the doctors of the church, the theologians of the church testify to and explain that doctrine. The majority of doctrines that we believe as Catholics come to us through the universal ordinary magisterium. Pope Pius the 11th said that the magisterium uh, this is the magisterium of the church that is exercised every day. It's exercised every day. This was the, the teaching of Vatican I when it talked about uh, the faith and what we are supposed to believe as uh, Catholics. Uh, Vatican I said this, um, that all those things must be believed by divine and Catholic faith which are contained in the written word of God or in tradition and which are proposed for belief as divinely revealed truths by the authority of the church acting either through a solemn pronouncement or through its ordinary and universal magisterium. So this is solemn declaration by Vatican I. So we have to give our assent faith to what the church proposes this way. So it's not option. It's not option. Uh, we're obliged to believe this as, as Catholics. So all the different things that I listed at the beginning of the sermon, 
All of those things come to us through the universal ordinary magisterium, which is infallible. It's infallible. Uh, the uh, universal extraordinary and the universal ordinary magisterium are both infallible. Uh, the extraordinary magisterium, this, these uh, rare solemn pronouncements, are, are, are some, uh, somehow not more infallible than the ordinary magisterium, nor does it somehow trump the teaching of the universal ordinary magisterium, because the, the idea is that the truth is, is one. What God expects us to believe is a package deal. It is one thing. Both are part of the same magisterium. Both teach the same thing. Both must be believed. We find this reiterated in the teachings of, of, of popes, councils, and, and uh, theologians. Uh, the, uh, Pope Pius XII, he says encyclicals fall under universal ordinary magisterium. Uh, Pope Pius IX says as well that the universal teaching of theologians about a, a Catholic doctrine uh, something that they teach it with a universal and constant consent as being part of the faith, that that's part of the universal ordinary magisterium as well. Why? Because the church exercises her vigilance over the doctrines that uh, are taught in her schools, in her seminaries, and in the, the publications of Catholic theologians. So when you find a doctrine attested to in all these different sources, uh, you know it is part of the universal ordinary magisterium. Now that's one of the points, by the way, that I make with the um, all the time with the um, uh, Feniites, with the fo uh, followers of the, the theories of Father uh, Leonard Feeney, who teach that the baptism of desire and baptism of blood um, uh, are, are not to be believed. That um, uh, one simply can't say that because the principles are wrong. These things are part of the universal ordinary magisterium, that, uh, as, uh, and uh, they're uh, taught constantly by the church. And according to these principles, you have to accept them. It's not optional. It's not optional. So, uh, you know, from uh, you know, popes, bishops, and so on, consistently cited the, uh, the teachings of theologians and their pronouncements. The church watched over and directed theological schools and so on. So you, you can't just blow off a doctrine that is taught unanimously. Why is this so important to recognize? Why do I bring this up? Well, the first is the obvious point. That the majority of doctrines that we believe as Catholics come to us from the Church's universal, ordinary magisterium, which is infallible, which is infallible. Secondly, modernists undercut the Catholic uh, teaching by rejecting the universal, ordinary magisterium. They will say, if something is not solemnly defined, it's not really infallible, it's not really immutable, therefore I can deny it. I can conscientiously dissent. If you were growing up in the 60s, if you were in a modernist seminary in the 60s as I was, this is what you would hear from the modernists all the time. Well, there are only very few things that are infallibly defined, and therefore I can dissent from this doctrine, I can dissent from that doctrine. And that, that is how the modernists undercut the teaching of the Catholic Church and use it to, to justify uh, one error and one aberration after another. Also, uh, I bring this up because it is the universal ordinary magisterium that proves the falsehood of Vatican II and proves the loss of authority on the part of the post-conciliar popes, so-called. That the teaching of Vatican II on a matter such as religious liberty uh, contradicts 
the previous teaching of the universal ordinary magisterium. And therefore, uh, uh, cannot be accepted, must be rejected as something that is heretical because it, it contradicts what the church has taught before. Or if we take another matter, we take the question of the nature of the Catholic Church. How the Catholic Church is uh, undivided in herself and separate from any other. Undivided in herself, uh, in divisa and se, the theologians say, et, uh, uh, as, uh, separata ab alis, and separated from another. Uh, the, the, the Church uh, does not have bits and, and pieces here and there. And we contrast that teaching of the uh, universal ordinary magisterium with the teachings of Vatican II and subsequent theologians and the teachings of John Paul II and the teachings of Benedict XVI, Ratzinger, uh, his the theological ideas on uh, the church is beginning with the people of God and so on. And there, there is a contradiction there. There is, uh, and this contradiction, contradiction of the universal ordinary magisterium, demonstrates that these people are teaching heresy, that they are teaching something contrary to the infallible teaching of the Church before Vatican II. So it, 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 uh, 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 this is how we arrive at the conclusion that we arrive at. Fourthly. The fourth reason why this notion is important is that there are many odd ideas floating around in the traditionalist movement about papal authority and uh, other doctrines. And there are many traditionalists who believe that, well, if something is not um, uh, taught ex cathedra, I really don't have to believe it. So uh, there uh, were no solemn pronouncements in Vatican II, as there were in Vatican I. So we can um, dismiss that as, um, uh, as something that we really don't have to accept. It's something that uh, is, is optional, and that we can go on uh, resisting the uh, hierarchy of the new church and, and uh, promote the idea that, well, it's really only a few areas that one has to be subject to the teaching authority of the Roman Pontiff. Now, the traditionalist movement has uh, promoted this false notion uh, for, what, nearly four decades, nearly four decades. And with it promoted the, the uh, idea that there's no need to be subject to pontiff because they will not, uh, they misunderstand the nature of the universal ordinary magisterium uh, and how it is in fact that that, that, that that proves that the post conciliar popes are not who and what they claim to be. So there's a lack of knowledge. Uh, on the part of laity or even priests as to, as, as to how this is supposed to work. And uh, unfortunately it's, it's um, very, very widespread in the traditional movement. And uh, what uh, the other problem that comes along with that is that uh, in uh, the new church there is this tendency now uh, especially with the uh, uh, Benedict XVI's motu proprio on the traditional mass, to simply uh, reduce the practice of religion to religious ceremonies. That you have a um, you have your traditional mass over in uh, this part of the organization, and you're content, and uh, you have the new mass over in this other part of the organization and you're content with that and the two are equal that the uh, you can have a uh, traditional right here the new right here and both are on the same level or that in one corner you can teach the Baltimore Catechism and everything that um, all the teachings that are found therein in another corner you can teach from the new catechism and there's no problem with that so what you end up with is the 
in effect, the triumph of the modernist revolution. It's been the goal of the church, of, of the enemies of the church since the 19th century to reduce religion to purely uh, a, a matter of sentiment and a feeling of, and, uh, of externals, where dogma does not matter. So if you believe, if you limit the... Um, idea of, the uni- uh, of uh, what you're obliged to believe as a Catholic to simply solemn definitions, then you open the way. You open the way for this, this dogmaless super church, the goal of, of the, the uh, Masonic and modernist revolutionaries. Well, so now you know how to answer my evil twin. <laughs> Catholics are obliged then to give the assent of faith not only to doctrines that are expressly defined in the rare solemn pronouncements of popes and ecumenical councils, but also to those teachings that are proposed by the universal ordinary magisterium. The universal ordinary magisterium once again is this. The teaching of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, that is to say the pope and the bishops together, throughout the world, whether in council or dispersed throughout the world concerning faith and morals. And that teaching too, as Catholics, we are obliged to believe. It is always free from error and uh, the, uh, it is that very teaching that uh, puts the lie to the notion that the post-Vatican II church represents the true church of Christ. Thus also the church, St. Cyprian says, all bright with the light of the Lord sheds her rays on the whole world. Yet it is one light which is spread everywhere, nor is the unity of the body divided. From her womb we are born By her milk we are nourished. By her spirit we are animated. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.